around the moment. Okay, the meeting is now open to the public. I advise those members who are in the public gallery. None. And they're welcome to use their mobile devices as long as they're in airplane mode and all devices are muted. They can connect to the assembly Wi-Fi. Password details are available in the gallery rules. It is not permitted to take photographs or record any of the meetings. I'm Minister. Uh, can we ask uh, the members to ensure that their electronic devices are switched to mute mode to ensure quality of the sound recording? And if we're content, are we happy to move through the agenda, uh, ladies and gentlemen? Uh, no apologies have been received, and there are none required because we're all here. Uh, I'd like to remind the members that we're all obliged to declare any relevant financial or other interest at each committee meeting as applicable. Are there any declarations to be made? Chair, I should um, just make a brief statement for the record that I um, formerly was a colleague of uh, the Permanent Secretary uh, at UK Government level. Um, we, we had a, um, <coughs> worked together briefly, uh, a number of years ago. So worth declaring for the record. Absolutely, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> so noted. <laughs> I was going to say something about somebody, but I'll not. That's a serious situation. Okay. Uh, can we move on then to uh, look at the draft minutes of the proceedings of the 22nd of January? Draft minutes of the meeting are at page 5. Members of all those who were here, are we content with the draft minutes that they're an accurate record of proceedings? If we are agreed, are we happy to have the minutes published on the website? Agreed. Agreed. Uh, matters arising. There are no matters arising. Uh, I just want to remind everybody this is ministerial evidence session and overview of ministerial priorities for the mandate. The agenda item is being recorded for Hansard. And may I welcome Connor and Sue and Joanne. Uh, welcome to the committee. And hopefully we'll have a full and fruitful relationship over the remaining years of this mandate as we continue to go to. Very much hope so. Yep. I'd like to draw the members' attention to a briefing from the committee clerk, which is at page 13 of your notes, and a letter from the minister regarding key issues is at page 17. I would also draw the members' attention to following a request at the meeting of the 22nd of January, which is included in page 19, is the draft memorandum of understanding for the budget process between the Northern Ireland Assembly and the Northern Ireland Executive that was developed by the Committee for Finance and Personnel during the 2011 mandate. And obviously, we would wish to progress that. <coughs> I would also draw the members' attention to a series of other relevant papers which provide additional information, which are at pages 31 to 41 to your brief. And I'd also like to inform members that the table papers is a letter received on Friday, the 24th of January 2020, from the Minister informing the Committee of a ministerial statement we had on the 27th of January, along with a copy of the statement which we provided to members on Monday. Minister. We were delighted to hear from you. Thank you very much, Chair, uh, and thanks to the committee members for the invitation to come along. Uh, can I say at the outset, I'm a previous chair of the Finance Committee. I was very ably assisted by Jim there in my time in the chair, and uh, previous chair of the Economy Committee. So Jim. I recognise well, Jim assisted me at times too, but uh, <laughs> uh, I, don't I, don't don't deny, I deny that entirely. <laughs> the sake of clarity for the number of Jims within the yeah, committee. Yeah. Well, the clerk. Uh, so uh, I very much recognise and realise the importance of a good working relationship between the department and the minister and the committee. I uh, value the role that the scrutiny committees play in the whole arrangement uh, of devolved government here, uh, which is a crucial role. So I very much want to work with that. I know we've had some hiccups at the start, given the kind of frantic nature of the first couple of weeks uh, of the business. We're all back at but uh, it is my intention. Uh, to work very closely with you to uh, to make sure that you're provided with whatever information uh, is is required and appropriate uh, at the earliest possible time, so the committee can get on with doing its important work. Uh, and I want to develop that relationship uh, as we go along. And I did have an earlier meeting with yourself and the deputy chair, uh, in which we made that clear. But uh, as I say, I, I want to obviously demonstrate that as the time goes on and, and build a good working relationship with the committee. 
The key priority, uh, I'm sure, is no surprise to people since in the last two, two and a half weeks now that we're, we're, we're back in at this, uh, the key priority has been to try and secure uh, a financial commitment attached to the commitments that were given in the new decade, new approach document written, uh, drafted by both governments, uh, to try and ensure that the initial uh, offer which was made on behalf of the British Government, which uh, in, in the view of the Executive and certainly my own view, is, is not anywhere approaching the commitments that were given. And, and all of the parties who were party to the negotiations know that those, uh, those uh, commitments that were given in that document weren't a kind of Santa Claus wish list. They were carefully worked out through a series of discussions between all of the parties, senior officials from the Department of Finance, senior official, uh, senior, the head of the civil service here, and senior officials from the Northern Ireland office. Connor, at some stage in your remarks, could you, if you've got an indication, could you allude to the, the delta, the difference between the ask and what we're expecting as well? Well, I, I probably couldn't give a, an accurate figure because the exercise that we're involved in, we were, I can tell you what we were offered, but uh, the exercise that we are involved in, which is still continuing, uh, and we've asked for all the department's cooperation in this, is to cost carefully. And, and some of the some of the priorities that were listed in the in the thing involve strategies and programmes which are not easy to cost in a very accurate way, but was to collate the costs of that. We've had a preliminary discussion with Treasury last Thursday. Uh, which I thought was very productive, uh, in, in which we, I think there is an acceptance that this is a discussion which has to continue, uh, that we, what we want to see is the commitments delivered on, and that we intend, uh, as an executive, through working with the other minister, but as the, this department taking the lead in relation to that, is to go back with a very carefully costed proposition uh, to Treasury and to begin that uh, more intensive engagement in, in terms of trying to secure that. So. The, 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 the final part of that, in, in terms of the entire quantum, hasn't been thoroughly worked through yet. That's the work that has been ongoing over the last week and a half, two weeks, across all the departments. It involves all departments, in some cases, cross-cutting issues, yeah. which will involve departments cooperating with each other. But the sooner we have that work done, the better, because it means the sooner we can go back to I'm just being slightly more interactive about this. So have we got a rough timeline when we're expecting that? Uh, next couple of, in the next couple of weeks, next I think one. the exercise will be completed. It's also, uh, you know, looking at depart getting departments to look at their pressures, the costing those proposals, and actually, you know, the prioritisation as well to deliver. Okay. Yeah. Um, this is quite a big piece of work for yeah. them. Which will also then obviously have some executive sign-off because then if we propose to go and engage in that document, we'll have to know what the priorities are in relation to that, and so it requires an executive input as well. Uh, of the, the money that was on offer, uh, as people will be aware, anyone has been following, two billion, uh, of which one billion was related to future Barnet consequentials, which means it was money already going to come to the executive in that sense. It wasn't what is called new money. The, of the remaining one billion, 240 of that was previously committed under the confidence and supply arrangement between the ZUP and the British Government uh, and was intended to be carried in through this as part of it rather than separate from that. So that was leaving something like 760 million. We are told that we have no, the, the only formal communication that the Department has had in relation to this is the actual document itself. So there's been nothing further from Treasury to say this is. This is what it is. This is over what year, but our understanding is that was over five years, which represents significantly way short of what is required. Uh, that's about 150 something million per year for five years of new money. Uh, and so we made the point: health alone requires almost 500 million yeah. uh, to, to uh, uh, next year. Uh, so it's, it's way short of all of that. So that that's the that's been the uh, I suppose the focus for myself. Uh, mandated by the executive to go off and, and engage and to try and get that work collated and, and begin that engagement with the Treasury. So I'm not using that as a reason why I haven't been dealing with all of the other uh, constituent parts of the department, but and that's why I have two uh, people who know this, the department inside out alongside me. So if there are questions that I can't answer, I'll be asking them and relying on them, certainly in the first instance, to, uh, to pick up on some of that. But that has been the focus. So I, I suppose a lot of other ministers have been off getting delved into their department. We've been off kind of fighting the fight on behalf of the whole executive and trying to do that piece of work. But that's not a, an excuse for not knowing all I need to know. Uh, uh, but uh, certainly uh, that has been my priority. Uh, over the last while. So, as I say, we're doing that. 
that costings. In the longer term, we, the, the intention obviously is to align. We, we will be into a one-year budget, uh, as, as you will know, and we'll be coming fairly soon with propositions raising that. That's because there's a spending review happening in Whitehall. Uh, as, a, as a consequence of the new government, so it's not it's not uh, possible to put in a multi-year budget now. The intention is to get into that as quickly as we possibly can to align a multi-year budget to program for government outcomes, so that we can start to see a much further picture ahead. And I think that is something which, in my sense, is that is welcomed by all uh, people, all stakeholders. Uh, certainly, in terms of the pay discussions we've been having, people want that certainly going on over the years. And in terms of transformation. Uh, we want that certainly built in, and budgets attached to it over a number of years. Just for clarity, because previously in a question we had in closed session, we were just trying to get the timelines and we were reporting back the conversations we had. Maybe, Sue, could you just outline where we are with the budget, comprehensive spending review, next budget, and how that's likely to work over this year? Because obviously this year is going to be different, yeah. hopefully. So um, the, the budget, the, the Treasury have set the date for the budget of the 11th of March. Right. Um, and that, after that, then there will follow a spending review. We haven't actually got exact dates from them, but we're expecting that to take place late spring, early summer, to be completed July, August. And then they will, uh, you know, obviously reflect on all of that. And I think it is for discussion as to whether there will then be an autumn statement which would follow that spending review. The slight hiccup we've got is. Um, you know, we really need to set a budget here earlier than the 11th of March mm -hmm. um, to, you know, obviously to get rating bills out and everything else. So the timing's not ideal, um, but I think that, you know, well, working on the basis we have to probably do a budget before the 11th of March, we would then have to do some reconciliation or some fur you know, further announcement, I think, would be yeah. the plan early in the financial year. Um, to take account of what might be in the budget, which might be coming our way, um, but we haven't. You know, that, that's that's the timeline that we're working to. Which is obviously not an ideal situation okay. because the choice is then to leave it to beyond the 11th of March, which gives us a very very compressed time frame to get the budget correct, and uh, particularly in relation to rate spills, get those out uh, agreed and out, uh, which is possibly uh, probably too short a time frame. Yeah. So it means you're taking decisions ahead, which are then. Uh, impacted on by whatever comes out of the budget. It was a very significant uh, amount of money then to be, uh, as a consequence of that, then it, it, we'd have to consider yeah. what process we would do that by. If it wasn't so significant, perhaps a June monitoring round would allow us to reallocate some money flowing from the budget. But it's not ideal. It's certainly not the position you'd want no. to be in this year. But and the intention is in bearing in mind we're doing this at the same time, we're trying to work out the pressures for. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 So it it is, and I'm, we're serving notice to this committee because you're the committee yeah. that will be dealing with it. Uh, just to give you a, a sense of the, I suppose the, the the issues that are facing us and the thinking behind. So if we're saying well, we're doing this budget, and people are saying, well, why would you do it now? And there's more to come. Uh, you understand that it's too tight of a time frame on the other side of that. So I think that certainly the current thinking that we've had this discussion in the department, the current thinking is to go ahead of it. Uh, and then try and reallocate if anything flows from that budget. It's not ideal, but uh, to us, it's better than, than actually losing maybe who knows what consequence might arise and, and losing the time frame that is, is too short on the other side of the 11th of March. Okay. Uh, so, uh, and that does bring us, I suppose, on to the discussion on rates. We have to do the uh, regional rate poundage levels for next year. That's a core part of the budget settlement, and we also need to take into account whatever uh, discussions with Treasury on the level of funding to be provided to the Executive. So we'll be looking at both domestic and non-domestic rates very carefully in the context of the budget. There's no decision being taken on either as yet. Uh, we're, we're beginning the discussions uh, over the last few days in the Department. And as I, I presume, I'm not any different to anybody here, we're, we're trying to find a rate system which is fair uh, and fit for purpose and which assists the executive's policies for growth in terms of the economy, in terms of the high streets, to try and uh, and also for households as well. So that isn't an easy uh, thing to balance out because it, whenever you do uh, change the rating system or make alterations, you'll always find that some people are content with that and some people are not so content with that. Uh, and it's to try and find that balance and, and, and the revaluation has fitted into that. There has been an extensive consultation in relation to non-domestic rates. Uh, over the autumn period, that has come back in. We're going to look at that as part of this, but we have to look at, at the at the both the domestic and non-domestic, and and that's going to be a, an important part uh, of the, the budget process. Uh, the uh, 
The, another issue which is coming up, obviously people will be aware of, is the pay award for the civil service. Uh, we have, I did a meeting with NIPSA last week who represents uh, some of the unions. There has been discussion with uh, uh, some of the industrial union, unions in relation to that as well. Uh, it was a, a, a positive discussion in terms of the, very clear uh, what the unions require. Uh, the department has begun officially negotiations with them, uh, and those are rolling on as, uh, as we speak. We would hope to be in a position in the next number of weeks to try and start to bring that to a conclusion. Uh, obviously, this pay settlement, as with the health pay settlement, as with the teaching pay settlements, all uh, will be coming out of the budgets available to us, and so there are big, big choices to be made in relation to all of that. Uh, but nonetheless, what we want to do is to try and find a fair and reasonable wage for people, and also to ensure that uh, part of the ongoing reform process of how work practices are carried out is part of all that discussion. That's much more easily uh, achieved in a multi-annual budget process, because then you can you can chart that into the future and chart uh, progression in terms of work practices. But the, the unions we spoke to are very clear with the position we've just been telling you about, they need to do a one-year budget, uh, and the, the objective is to try and use that as a bridge to a new arrangement into the future. Uh, so that's, that's essentially what we've been talking to them about, and uh, the department officials have been uh, negotiating with the unions over the last. And your morning. sense is that the unions are aware of the fact with the sort of the constraints that we have within within year, and particularly looking at sort of potential of industrial action and the rest of it, that we are. They are, they are cognizant of the issues we have at the moment, or do you feel as if we're uh, we are heading to a more difficult situation? Well, I mean, the, the unions can obviously speak for themselves, and they have a duty to represent the interests of the, of the people who are who are the workers that are part of their union, and so they're obviously going to try and get the best deal possible for them, and I fully accept that. Uh, they have publicly said that they understand the executive is operating under a very restricted uh, financial situation. Uh, but the negotiations will roll on. They have a duty to represent the people they represent, and we have a duty to try and manage the purse uh, and, and, and see what is affordable to us. Uh, and that doesn't just go for the, the civil service. The one is obviously within my own department's uh, ambit, but obviously the education department are talking to teaching staff and others. And we did have the issue in relation to the medical staff, which we managed to resolve uh, as uh, early on in the existence of this executive. Uh, the, uh, one of the other issues, I suppose, is just a quick gallop through these, and then I'm, I'm, I'm happy to take uh, questions, uh, and, and obviously Sue and Joanne uh, will chip in uh, as, as needs be. The NDNA, uh, NDNA document, which is, is kind of now the code for it, because most people can't remember the actual name of it. But, uh, we all keep what's called <laughs> deal rather than... So, uh, so it obviously contained... Uh, it contained work from the work streams that was done, and in particular, all of the five parties that are in the executive were involved in the work stream in relation to transparency. So we had an agreement to have a significant improvement in terms of transparency, responsibility, accountability, uh, and a number of, uh, of measures were undertaken. The department was responsible for taking forward uh, not just the code of conduct for special advisors, but also the strengthening draft of the ministerial code and the Northern Ireland Civil Service Code of Ethics. So all those, all of those. Uh, documents are being worked through now as a consequence of the discussions that all of the parties had, particularly over the course of last summer, uh, as part of the talks process. So there, there isn't, uh, there are not any major surprises in relation to that. But uh, that's what the intention is to strengthen uh, those codes. The uh, obviously we'll have to take account of what emerges from the RHI inquiry, mm -hmm. uh, which we're expecting. Uh, in a number of weeks' time, but again, we don't have any input into setting the date for uh, that, so it's, it's a matter of when the inquiry is ready to come forward with its report. But whatever is produced is, is certainly to get us off on the road in terms of strengthened uh, requirements in those codes and, and increased transparency, but we will have to take into account what the recommendations may flow from the RHI inquiries. That may <coughs> involve revisiting these things, uh, but there was a necessity, particularly with the special advisors, code because uh, people needed to be employed. They're an important part of the machinery of government here, and the, that was the, the reason that we, we took that out of, if you like, the pack. <coughs> Some of the other ones weren't just ready, hadn't completed, to get those so that ministers could go ahead and make those appointments. Uh, so the, that document was, was sent to you, and I know uh, in, in normal circumstances we would have hoped mm -hmm. to have got that to the committee earlier for some uh, input to it, but uh, that, that has been published. Uh, advisors are in the 
process have been appointed. I think some are, some are in the process have been appointed. But uh, obviously, if we want ministers off working quickly and the executive starting to function as quickly as possibly can, then we needed to get those people in place, and that's why that uh, that was uh, done earlier. Uh, the uh, sorry, just picking up on some of the other issues. Yeah, one of the issues that I suppose. Uh, Came to light in terms, uh, uh, came into some attention in terms of the January monitoring round statement they did the other day in the assembly. And and as I say again, what we want to certainly do is some of the issues in, in, in those. Generally speaking, some issues have to go to the executive for approval before they can be shared with the committee, and we want to just get that process right so that we're clear in understanding that, and then that as early as possible that they're shared with the committee. So again, it was one of those issues which needed uh, executive approval. There was a, a time factor in terms of getting the January monitoring round statement out, and therefore we, we, we were squeezed again. But uh, as everybody will know, I'm sure yourselves, from the committee staff and everybody, we're kind of, everybody's scrambling to catch up and get ourselves back into a rhythm of how these things operate, and I would anticipate in the coming weeks that we start to get into uh, a more streamlined way of working so we can we can we can get these processes sorted but one of the issues that did arise was the issue of financial transaction mm -hmm. capital uh, and the return of 150 million pounds uh, which none of us want to see and uh, that it, it's lost because we've been unable to spend it. It's not a position that the executive want to be in. And there was some commentary made in relation to what it could have been used for and should have been used for, which is incorrect. So I just wanted to make sure that people understood the financial transaction capital can only be used for loans to our equity investment in private sector bodies. So it can't be used to settle pay disputes. It can't be used to boost or uh, tackle waiting lists. It can't. You know there there are restrictions in terms of, of how it's been used. So. The, the, the nature of this means that there's significant propriety work due to ensure due diligence before it can be issued, which requires appropriate leaving time. That's why it wasn't possible for the executive in the two-week period it was in existence to try and get in behind that and to try and make some uh, changes to that. So uh, it couldn't be used to fund other pressures such as pay claims or any other pressures in the system. It has to be used. So I think, but, Minister, uh, you know, we thank you for that. But I think sort of the concerns were. The fact with the culture within the organisation, when there wasn't ministers, the fact that this had been around for some time, yeah. and the fact that there wasn't any, didn't seem to be any degree of urgency to be able to utilise this resource. And as sort of Sue's well knows, so, so the Treasury smiles at you when we give you the money and you get back to them again, they're more than happy to take it. Now, it's something about the culture, and I know that can't be put at your door at the moment, but it's something that, you know, we are going forward. Northern Ireland Civil Service must be fully aware of what it should be doing to be able to do that. Well, there are. I mean, we've been discussing this in the department. Because I think you're correct in that we want to ensure this does. It's not a good position when we're going to Treasury in relation to, if you like, the the, the document and the commitments we have that, and we're handing back money, even though it's it's a different type of money, if you like. Uh, but it's not it's not a position we want to be in. Some of the things were beyond the, the control of the departments here, such as the legislation, which should housing have been association. housing yes. association could, should have been passed in Westminster wasn't, so that would have allowed uh, a significant uptake in some of that. But there are other tweaks I think we, we need to make to the system to give departments more scope and more various in terms yeah. of how they, they, yeah. they develop. Some of it has to be developed by departments and then put back into the TEO for approval in terms of business yeah. cases and that. So there, there are yeah. perhaps some layers of bureaucratic control there that can be loosened yeah. somewhat without getting rid of the propriety which is required for it, but which can be used to ensure departments have more authority in terms of how they spend it. And I think there is a, um, I mean, that's absolutely right. So, I mean, first of all, the housing associations, you know, if, if we can get the reclassification sorted through legislation, that will make a huge difference. They will be able to access <coughs> financial transaction capital, which they haven't been able to do. We, we you know, been pressing for that. Um, I think there is also a capability issue for us in the civil service as to whether you know we have got the uh, the, cap the skill set I suppose to look at that investment that investment funding so there's a piece of work there and then I think there is this this, this you know some departments can't don't have the ability to use FTC because they haven't got the virus so it has to be rooted through the strategic investment board then through TO so it just it's another hurdle. And I think we've got to try to remove some of those hurdles. But that is a very important piece of work for us. And just to conclude, Chairman, uh, it's, uh, obviously the committee here will have an interest in, uh, in that overarching picture of how all the departments are functioning through the, mm -hmm. the, the direction and, and, and uh, 
uh, interaction with the finance department, but then within the department itself, there are obviously a range of services, and I, 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 I understand that you're going to get some of them in the uh, rates collection, land registration, the IT and HR. And so we, there's a continual program to try and improve those services, to try and uh, you know modernise them, update them, and ensure that they're providing the best possible service to the public. So there will be the work of the department itself. Uh, while well, we have that overarching role in terms of, of funding all the departments and uh, having that kind of strategic role, uh, there is in-house stuff which I, I don't doubt the committee will want uh, to get its teeth into and see how these services are working. And there's a continuous attempt within the department to improve those services, and, and we'd be happy to speak to you over the course of your work as to how they are coming along. Okay, thanks very much, indeed, Minister. I'll uh, kick off. Uh, just first sort of question I wanted to ask. One of the things, obviously, within the uh, uh, New decade document. I'm not going down to that. It's all over again. Um, but the question about establishment of the fiscal council and the establishment of when it's going to be up and running. And again, it's one of the things that particularly we want to see happening early on because we need to change the culture of how we do business. So, can you brief me and update us on where we are now on sort of the setting up of the fiscal council and when we can expect it to be in place? Well, you're right. It's, it's mentioned in the document. There isn't much. No. Around it, other than saying it, there will, so, be one. <laughs> there will be one. It is up to the Department of Finance, obviously, to, to start to, to scope out uh, what it would be involved in, what the terms of reference were, who, who would be on it, what type of people we want to engage. And it would provide an important role in terms of assisting the executive overall with uh, spending the budget's strategic direction, you know, uh, revenue raising additional uh, fiscal powers if that were uh, made available to us, uh, all of these things. So it, it is an important role. It obviously would have to chime with the executives uh, and understanding the executives' priorities, the programme for government priorities, uh, and the, the finances available to us to, to carry those out. So it, 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 essentially the ball has been passed over to us in the Department of Finance, uh, and we have to uh, start to do that work in, in terms of scoping that out. Uh, and there already have some discussions begun yeah. in the Department. Can raise that, and perhaps Sue can tell us in terms yeah. of time frame yeah. when we might see some. So product. I think we, we've we've started the work um, just to look at the options. You know, we're looking at other models. We're like looking at the uh, Office of Budget Responsibility um, to see you know how they work, and we're looking at other other models. And we would expect to be able to put something to the minister in a couple of weeks. Um, on options for discussion, um, but I mean, you know, we're also looking at, you know, how do we appoint, how would we appoint people to it? Um, what would be the process? Uh, are there people ex external? You know, it, it's that we're at a very early stage of that sort of uh, scoping, uh, scoping out our options. But I think we, we haven't had, we haven't been able to have a discussion with you yet because yeah. we're still discussing it around the options. But we are looking at other models and how they work and. How they can be sometimes they are very directly accountable to you know to, to Parliament in Westminster, but to the Assembly here, uh, to the to the executive. You know, just looking at all of that, not having any actually form view about it, and actually trying to be quite open. Um, I would encourage discussion with the committee yeah, at, sorry, at every stage of this process yeah. because look, if we are going to try and make yeah. this work, one of the keys is to be able to show yeah. that we have got some effective oversight. Yeah. And one of the reasons we're in the mess of where we are at the moment is we haven't had effective oversight. So as we're getting into the budgetary process and getting ready yeah. particularly for next year, yeah. we really need to have this in place. Yeah. And it, I think it needs to be with a degree of urgency that's put yeah. in place. Yeah. And also, and I think I speak for, um, I don't know, I won't speak for the rest of the committee, but from my perspective, it has to be as independent as possible. Or else we'll go into that where we get to that state as well. But thank you for that. Um, sort of the second question before I open up to the <coughs> rest of the floor. Um, uh, corporation tax. Where are we in corporation tax? Is it in? Is it out? What is happening? Well, and is there any sort of dialogue between yourselves and economy? And where are we going on this? No, there, there isn't an. It hasn't been an executive discussion on it, and there isn't an executive uh, position other than the position I suppose was agreed in Stormont House which is that the executive is a, a, a power the executive would like to have. It was caveated in terms of subject to affordability. Uh, I was asked about it in an interview uh, on Radio Ulster, I think, uh, a few days into my brief, and I, I made the observations that, uh, I mean, at the time we were discussing at the Stormont House, the, the rate, I think, was 22.5%. It's now 17.5%. So the difference between it and the South has, has significantly reduced. That was prior to Brexit. 
which has had a big impact in relation to it. And it's also prior to the full impact of austerity, which means that the affordability factor is more acute now than perhaps it even was at the time of those discussions were happening. So all of those factors have come in, uh, and I just made the, the, the point that it's not something I was actively pursuing. Uh, I know uh, that the Department of Economy is certainly would like to have it in its locker as a, as a, you know, a selling point when it goes uh, to talk to some businesses internationally. But the executive hasn't had a discussion on this yet. I'm just <coughs> making the observations that the, if the, the factors that were in consideration at the time the executive were agreeing to try and pursue it have significantly altered. Uh, and I think affordability is a real uh, challenge in relation to it now. And also the impact it would have in terms of being a game changer uh, as it was there, uh, given the impact of Brexit and given the reduction on the tax. And also when we see now that with Britain leaving the EU, uh, and being perhaps able to set its own uh, without, you know, not considered to be state aid and all of the, the issues that flow from that. There may be an actual, a, another change to approach in corporation tax in Britain, which has a factor as well. So I don't think it's, it's not something I'm actively pursuing because I don't think it's something that we can actually ascertain at this moment in time what the, the benefits are, are, are uh, downside of it may be, uh, and, and factors will change as the kind of future relationships uh, is, are negotiated out between Britain and the EU27, and that, that will have an impact on, on, on us here as well. Okay, thanks very much indeed. Paul? Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, can I first of all say, as Deputy Chair of the Finance Committee, I genuinely wish you all the best in your role. Thank you. And I also genuinely wish Sue, from the Secretary, all thank the best you. in her role. I, I'm mindful that even since you've came here, this is really you getting to turn the cogs. Uh, so I do genuinely wish you both the very best, because genuinely, we only have one more crack at this, I do believe, uh, for the people of Northern Ireland. <coughs> and I also respect you, Minister, because I've sat on committees along with you, and I know that you ask the tough questions, and you wouldn't expect anything less from us. Uh, on the 21st of just January... just you up. <laughs> <laughs> on the 21st of January 2017, David Sterling sent a text message to fellow Permanent Secretary Andrew McCormick. Mr Sterling said of his minister, I can't say whether the will is there and wonder whether he knows himself. He may be acting under instruction. As the most senior civil servant in the Finance Department, Mr David Sterling, believed that the then Finance Minister, your ex-colleague, may have been acting under instruction. Minister, are you acting under instruction? No, I'm acting as part, two parts. Firstly, part of a collective executive. Uh, so we have a collective responsibility in the executive. So uh, while you have ministerial authority and autonomy to an extent within your own department, uh, there's none of us should or, or could be going on solar runs and doing things uh, in, in complete defiance of the executive. So there is that, that level. We're also members of political parties. Uh, and I'm here because my political party appointed me to be here. They nominated me to be a minister. And so I have a responsibility to my political party as well. So all of us, I'm sure you do in committee, you're not here acting on your own bat. Uh, you're part of a team of, of DUP MLAs and you're, you're answerable to your party, as well as performing your responsibility as an elected representative to the people who elected you. So we all have, if you like, multiple uh, rules in terms of accountability. Uh, but in terms of, of what's doing what's best, I'm acting in, in accordance with the agreed programme for government of the executive. I'm acting in accordance with the uh, <coughs> Deputy First Minister who appointed me uh, to this position and not in, in responsibility to anyone else. The RHI inquiry brought to light emails and text messages showing uh, the past Finance Minister in constant contact with veteran Republicans outside of this elected assembly. Uh, Patrick Wilson, Martin Lynch and Ted Howell are names that are in the public domain. What do those names mean to you, Minister? Well, can I say in relation to that, uh, and I'm, I'm very conscious because the RHI inquiry hasn't reported yet, uh, but I can just say in general terms, when any party, uh, and I don't doubt we're unique in this, when any party is in, in, the, in the minute of a crisis, uh, what you try and do, and this happens with all parties, I expect. And that the period that you're referring to was a, it was a crisis. This this institution was on the verge of collapse, uh, both pre-Christmas and post-Christmas uh, in that 2016-2017 period. Uh, what parties do is they try and manage that crisis. 
So they pull together teams to manage a crisis, which tries to coordinate across all of the activities that go on within the party. So you have the Deputy First Minister's Office, you have the Finance Department, which is in the middle of, of perhaps setting up an inquiry into RHI, you have the people who are on the Economy Committee, you have other ministers, you have people on the various scrutiny committees. So you try and manage it to make sure that whatever your response to the crisis is, that it is in some ways coordinated, so you don't have one branch of the party off doing and saying one thing and somebody doing something in contradiction. And so that involves people who manage uh, now, some people may draft and other people are elected representatives to it. Most parties have chief executives, the people on their executive committees who aren't elected uh, representatives, and you involve people who can manage negotiations. Have we, as we have managed negotiations since the early 1990s uh, with all governments, uh, with prime ministers, with Tishi, uh, with US presidents, people in the European Union, and we manage that. So a party management team manages the middle of a crisis and all of the members, individual members of that team, try and coordinate their activities. That's in a general point to answer your question. I don't want to get into the specifics, but that's how we do business. And if there was a crisis here tomorrow morning, I don't doubt we would draft in a team to try and manage our, our response to it, which would involve a range of people, including elected and non-elected representatives. Thank you for your answer. Minister, how would that then be logged and catalogued and be transparent to both the executive, to the assembly and then to the wider public? We know that minutes will now be minuted, uh, meetings will now be minuted between officials and politicians and various interest groups. How will that engagement, if, you, if there's a crisis tomorrow and you pull together a team from outside of elected representatives <coughs> and the wider political party, how will that be documented and how will that be transparent to the public out there? Well, there are requirements in the code in terms of the ministerial responsibility and special advisor responsibility. If they're meeting on issues uh, germane to their departments, there are requirements produced in the code. And I say the, uh, the, the issues that were thrown up in terms of of spads and minuting of meetings. I mean, that was one aspect referred to in the inquiry, but the primary source of investigation was the behaviour of spads in relation to the RHI and the rollout of that scheme, not in terms of the response to the crisis that it created. Uh, but I, I understand where the focus of your questions is coming from, but uh, we want to ensure that special advisors, ministers, understand the requirements of them. We also changed the code to ensure that ministers are responsible and accountable for the special advisors, they employ them, they answer to them. Special advisors have a responsibility not just to the minister, but to the whole executive uh, as well. Uh, so you, you don't get into this kind of silo mentality. And there will be changes to the civil service code as well, uh, and uh, the ministerial code. So there are attempts to improve all of that. Uh, but as I say, the, 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 the primary driver in response to all that was actually from the behaviour that happened in the Department of Enterprise, Trade and Investment over the space of the rollout of the RHI programme. The response to that from other parties is also part and informs some of the changes that have been made, but that's the primary driver behind it. And so who will select your spot? I select my spot. You alone? Yeah. I am res I'm responsible for selecting them. Uh, I bring that to the person that I wish to appoint to the department uh, who do this function for all special advisors, who are not just Department of Finance one, but they provide a function for the executive as a whole. Uh, they examine the CV of that person and they will decide then uh, as to what the appropriate pay scale for that person will be. It won't be my responsibility to determine the pay for a special advisor. Uh, and the responsibility for management and behaviour of that person is mine. Can it I ask? Mine. So if the special advisor steps out of line or does something in relation to that, that responsibility then. They, they are, special advisor is a temporary civil servant, so they have a responsibility under the Northern Ireland Civil Service Code, which is, is due to be. Uh, uh, published shortly as well, uh, but it, that responsibility for that special advisor then falls to the Minister. Can I ask the Permanent Secretary, then, uh, have you sought advice from your colleague David Sterling uh, with regards to transparency and also the issues that he had back in 2017 with Ministers being under instruction? Um, I have not not that specific issue. I mean, obviously, as Permanent Secretaries, we have been um, you know, working through what has been coming out of the RHI inquiry and um, a lot of the codes, a lot of our processes, we have been, uh, you know, making changes um, and a lot of the, uh, the, the working group around uh, governance and transparency, which I chaired um, over the summer, the codes have been, you know, we've been reflecting on all of that, but also I have been in a very fortunate position in my previous role to be able to bring 
practice from that into looking at the codes that we have here. Um, and, uh, you know, we are regularly discussing those issues. Can I have a final question? Will the Minister release to the committee his first day brief in the interests of transparency? Yeah, I, I, you might find it very disappointing because it's only about four pages. Uh, so, I mean, I don't have any particular problems, but it wasn't, uh, really? kind of, it wasn't a detailed brief. Uh, what we, the first day was to kind of give it a general skip over departments, and what I've been doing then ever since is actually meeting the individual component parts of the department and going through in more detail. So, I, I mean, I'd, I, I'm happy to release the first day brief. I don't think uh, that you'll find uh, anything out of the ordinary, and it's, uh, it, it shouldn't take you too long to study it. Thank, Thank you very much, indeed. Alicia? I will. I do it just by lumps of quarrel and fizer. I'm sure on you. August uh, Fern Foster, uh, just at the outset, I'd like to just welcome you here today and your, for your, your team as well. Um, uh, we as the Anna for Hanya to hear us and uh, thank you for your report not to date. And in your report, Minister, you actually alluded to, to the competence and supply. Uh, could you maybe provide us with an update on that and whether or not it's the case that uh, the residual funding has been withdrawn? Well, we, we're still trying to work through. What we have is, I suppose at this moment, uh, uh, what verbally was given to us by the Secretary of State at a meeting, uh, in which they said, uh, which he said, that the comments supply was over, uh, and therefore the monies, which, uh, particularly in relation to the rollout for broadband, which it was understood and felt, and I mean we weren't privy to these discussions or arrangements prior to the executive being formed. Uh, it was felt that the money was being reprofiled and rolled out over later years. There was obviously some difficulty in getting the contracts up and running. Uh, and then there, were all, there was also a fund, I think, of £10 million a year for, for mental health projects yeah. over yeah. five years, was it? Yeah. Um, and yeah. and yeah. a deprivation fund. Yes. A year for severe deprivation. deprivation fund. So there were three. Well, just, 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 just slight chairman's problem. Just the confidence and rely on broadband. Is that the £150 million that wasn't? Yes. It, it amounts to a total of 240 yeah, million. Yeah, but the 150 million specifically for broadband. For broadband. For broadband. Yes. But not so like only three million of that's been spent or something, isn't that right? No, actually, it's the whole. It's, there has been further reprofiling, so it's the whole 150 million. Yeah. Right. Sorry. Sorry. Sorry, Marisha, sorry for doing that. I just yeah. wanted to. There was a, there was a hold up, and there was an understanding. That I'm, I'm reporting what was said verbally at a meeting. Right. There was an understanding that was being reprofiled and carried forward. Right. The Secretary of State made it clear it wasn't. It was part of this one billion, which was new money. Uh, and as I say, it didn't just include the broadband, it also included a, a fund uh, over a number of years for mental health and a fund over a number of years for deprivation. Right. Uh, so there were three elements to that. So we've been told that uh, I, the only documentation we have in relation to this is the, the agreement documentation. Uh, so we have to bottom that out. I mean, it obviously would be disappointing if even within the limited offer they made, already some of that has been committed and uh, is, is removed from it. So that would take it down to about £760 million, pounds, which is actually new money, not the £2 billion figure that had been announced. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, um, Minister, for coming today, and soon as well. And, uh, we don't have a conflict of interest, but I think we both shared the same sort of yes. profession at once yeah. as publicans. Yeah. And not Republicans, really I said publicans. <laughs> we both, we both Just to make it clear, there is a difference. <laughs> but let's, uh, Minister, uh, my question uh, is to do with small businesses and rates. And um, the, the, I know I'm, I've moved on from it, but I wanted to go back just to the one on the broadband. And when you brought your statement, uh, to the House on Monday. Um, I've seen 38 million, and I think another figure like 68 million. Uh, th that was the broadband. That was the broadband money, which wasn't um, made available, or, you know, which wasn't used, that loan that was set out for that. You also said in that statement that you had your ser serious concerns. Are we talking about the same money as you answered the question there to uh, my committee member? Yeah, you were talking about the monitor round statement. Yes, that's right. Was, no, there was, no. The broadband money wasn't in the monitor. Wasn't in the monitor. And then, but 
There, there, there was money there also brought back, which was loan money. It was 38 million. I seen it as a read it, and 68 million. You don't have an update on what that was used for, because at the bottom of that statement, you yourself said you had serious concerns. No, I, I think, I think, what you're asking for is the financial transactions capital, which in total amounted to 150 million. Yes, uh, which is very constrained in terms of how it can be spent. So it, 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 and my concerns were that we had got to a situation, albeit uh, I think as Sue has outlined, legislation which perhaps the housing associations had expected to be passed in Westminster didn't happen, and that, that would have accounted for a significant proportion of that. Uh, but nonetheless, we, we, we want to work with departments to make sure that they, uh, they work closely with us and the Strategic Investment Board, uh, and if necessary changes are made to the way this is handled so that departments can avail of it and can can use it properly, and we don't end up with a situation of giving that back. The broadband money that we were referring to was part of the confidence and supply arrangement yeah. between the DUP and the Conservative Party. Uh, in that was profiled a figure for, for broadband rollout, which obviously couldn't go ahead in the time frame envisaged originally, because uh, I presume for some contractual issues. Uh, and there was an understanding, uh, this is what reported, that that would be reprofiled and brought for a number of years. The Secretary of State told us, no, that's part of the one billion of new money, so it was in one hand given and the other hand taken back. And there were a couple of additional schemes, as I say, in relation to mental health and deprivation, which <coughs> were part of that confidence supply money. So it's two separate. The, the statement on Monday was reallocating, if you like, what the, the, the surrendered money in the departments, money that departments couldn't spend for the rest of the financial year was uh, surrendered and reallocated. Uh, so some of it went to special education needs, uh, to contractual issues in terms of teachers' pay. Uh, so that, that that was that portion of money that we were referring to on Monday. Yeah, but some I, I was led to believe, Minister, that that money itself then was passed back. That it wasn't spent at the 38 and 67 million. Yeah, that, that's the element of the financial transactions capital, yeah. which would have right, been okay. allocated that's to the department. That's fine. Which then, which they're not able to spend. Yeah. Well, look, thanks very much for answering that for me. But uh, my question was going to be on rates, uh, yeah. sir. Yeah. And I just noticed, you know, with the, the reval 2020 and the revaluation uh, on the properties, and coming from a small business myself, I mean, there has been winners and losers mm -hmm. uh, in all of this. And my question is. Um, <coughs> Does the Minister has views on, on that revaluation and whether he intends to look at this again and also on the amount of the revenue collected from the business rates for future years? Well, the, uh, as you say, the, the, the issue of revaluations, because I remember sitting on the previous Finance Committee, was that there hadn't been one for 13 years. So when people came to revalue for the rates, there suddenly was a very significant hike. So I think under both Mervyn Storey, when he was Finance Minister, and Marchie and Mulyard, uh, was an undertaking to do revaluations uh, more frequently so that, that there wouldn't be such a, 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 a significant gap. Now, understandably, when revaluations are taken, as you said, some people feel they come out the right side of that. I think there's something like 60 per cent mm -hmm. of small businesses either were the same or less in terms of the their rates due. Uh, but then those who, who get an increase, understandably, uh, will make an argument for, for why that shouldn't be the case. So w w there has been a significant uh, consultation with the, uh, with the business sector on the non-domestic rates. Uh, and I'm going to get an opportunity to look at that in the near future. And the revaluation issue, I've no doubt, will come into that as well, because it, it plays a part in determining uh, what rates are. The, the whole rates exercise is cost neutral, so it's not about trying to raise more yeah. money. It's trying to shift the, uh, the balance and make it more fair in terms of who's expected to pay what. That always, as you say, has what is considered to be winners and, and losers, and that understandably creates, uh, creates uh, issues where, where people feel uh, that that I mean, the, the economy is not going well. People are suffering the effects of austerity or having an impact on how much people are spent in small businesses. We understand fully all of that. So what I want to do is, uh, is to, to study what the uh, responses to the consultation have been. We're, we're trying to organise, I think, a roundtable with some of the business representative organisations to hear from them, particularly people in hospitality have been vocal about the impact on, on their sector, uh, and we want to hear from those people and then try. The, the overall objective, as is always, is to strike the first, most balanced rate possible to try and use it to assist the growth of the economy, the town centres, the high street traders, small businesses, uh, to try and do all of that. So I want to look at the full gambit of what we collect, where we collect it from, how we collect it, and, and try and come up with a fair possible system.
Okay, thanks very much, Mr. Lecturer. Just to, mm -hmm. you know, well, I'm sure you'll agree with me that small businesses are the backbone of our local economy here. And myself, working in a small bar in the centre of Belfast, uh, rates always probably did seem to be a burden. It always they have to be paid. They're one of those first things that you have to go out and try in order to get to there. But uh, I always felt it was unfair they used any of that which they termed as a monopoly. I'm not sure how that rating value sets through now, like i.e. on crisps or food. But on, on, on the high street uh, and the crisis that it's in, I'm sure the Minister uh, would agree with me that anything which can relieve that burden of rate or taxation upon our small businesses, and it, it, it does stifle that growth, if you like, and, and, and if we are trying to rebuild our centres up or bring people out, you know, or into them, or, or we really need to look at this. And I, I really would urge you, maybe I've, I've asked her to maybe re-look at it. I don't know if you have the process to look at that again yourself. Yeah. Uh, I think, well, first of all, I think that on the two issues, so we're obviously doing this wider review of business rates, yes. really important, and actually the consultation has been, uh, actually has been really good. We've had like something about 240 responses, uh, formal responses, but we've done an awful lot of cons consultation exercises um, with interested groups, and uh, we are analysing that, and we will be coming back to the Minister. Small business, uh, the small business relief scheme will be part of that. You know what, what, what the comments that we've had on it, on revaluation, it's hugely important because actually what it does is we, so we done it for, uh, this has been done after five years this time. Ideally, we probably would like to get to four years. <coughs> Um, but what it does is that you know it does take account um, when a business perhaps is going through a little bit of a tough time. You know, you can see you would then see a, possibly a decrease in the rates, and where a business is obviously doing a bit better, you will see a bit of an increase. Um, you know, we've published the uh, draft. The, the, what we've published is, a, is draft valuations, um, and I think also for the first time we put it on uh, in a very transparent way. We put it on Spatial NI so that everybody can go in and have a look at all these properties. You know, and, you, and actually, for the first time, you can see whether what you are paying, whether that feels fair to you or not. And I think that's a really good thing. Um, but you know, we are encouraging people, if they're unhappy, and I have to say, um, you know, uh, having had a pub previously myself, I would urge the hospitality sector to actually provide us with information. The, uh, the, uh, the, there's been a bit of a lack of information, and therefore we have to make a number of assumptions. So I would urge uh, the, you know, all out there to look. It's a draft valuation. Start that dialogue now. But we've got till now, till the end of March, before the formal rates, before those formal bills go out. This is a period where there's a bit of consultation going on, um, and only the. Sorry, just to, just to cut across. Yeah. I'm sorry, Pat. I'm sorry, sir. But yeah. just what specifically do you want from the hospitality sector? <laughs> they, that you we don't we really need have? their accounts. We need their accounts. Um, you know, there's, there's a form to fill in which gives details of their accounts, and that's really what we need. And Pat will remember it. I remember it. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think that's just really important. And that then enables a dialogue to happen with the land and property service and <coughs> actually trying to arrive at, a, at, you know, at the correct amount. If we've got it wrong, then we're really happy to have that discussion. Mm -hmm. But obviously, you know, we've had to make a number of assumptions. In some cases, we've had to rely on companies' house data. because, And that, that won't give you the granularity that you probably need. So I would just encourage, we've got a couple of months, and it's really important. Um, and then the wider review will deal with, I think, come back on the issues around, we've had lots of really great suggestions around rates. Um, and I think we just, we're just analysing all of that now. <coughs> And the small business relief scheme is actually one of those issues that's been raised. I just say, also, Chair, in, in terms of the stimulating the town centres and small, <coughs> there are a wide range of issues. The rates is a key factor in all of that because it's it's a, a, a very immediate bill and a cost to small businesses. But what we want to get to, and, and the department have been doing some innovative lab discussions yeah. Yeah. in relation um, to bringing all the departments. How do we yeah. stimulate town centres in terms of the built environment? You know. Parking, uh, access—you know all of those, all of those issues. So it, the, the rates doesn't become the only determinant factor yeah. as to how a town centre does yeah. or not. Is that we try and piece all of this together yeah. and get the best 
return because yeah. I mean I come from on both sides from small business uh, and understand entirely uh, <coughs> the, 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 how they struggle at times and how other times are better. Uh, but we, we're trying to get all of the various items which contribute to town centre growth pulling together yeah. rather than all doing their own individual. And bits. how we can incentivise. Yeah. Yeah. And that's encouraging. Uh, sorry, just to, just to recap. You feel that you're not getting enough information from the hospitality well, think, at the moment? So we, we have some information, but there are a large number where we haven't actually got enough information. So I think that we, uh, we put that plea out um, and we are asking people to get, if they haven't provided the information, to get the information to us so that we've got actuals to work on. Okay. I think Pat might, you, you understand, yeah. Yes, so it really is, what we're talking about is on the turnover or on the yes. accounts. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Thank you, Chair. Um, and congratulations, Minister, on being appointed and to the Permanent Secretary and Director for um, uh, for coming along today. You've all got a big job of work ahead of you, so um, thanks for taking the time. I mean that in, a, in an optimistic, hopeful way, not in a, um, not in a, a, a doom-laden way. Um, the questions I wanted to ask were actually to go back to the issue of the Fiscal Council and the broader questions about fiscal sustainability, um, which were... Um, at the heart, really, of the NDNA document, but as you both said, there's quite a lot of there are quite a lot of unanswered questions there. So, a few questions on that area. And again, I appreciate Minister Bruno in the job five minutes. So, um, uh, with that being said, That's why I have Sue here? Indeed. Um, <laughs> I've been in the whole would, you, would you um, do you want Northern Ireland to have more fiscal autonomy? Mm. Yeah, I think there, there, there are two issues there. One is, I suppose, if you had more fiscal autonomy, then the Fiscal Council would have much more to do. Yeah. Uh, I think that uh, we have very limited levers. Uh, you know, we've talked about rates. Yeah. Uh, there, there, you know, people talk the, the whole hard annuals of water charging, of prescription charging, of free transport for pensioners. Uh, so there, there is a list of about nine or ten issues that we can actually use to either generate revenue or uh, to, to reduce spending, yeah. uh, which would, I suppose, in turn generate revenue. So uh, I know that in Scotland uh, they did have a commission which was put together to look at the idea of more fiscal levers. I know there are other organisations here who have done work uh, in relation to that, if, if said, you know, if, if, if we had more fiscal autonomy, if we had more fiscal levers, then those aligned to our programme for government uh, objectives then could actually then assist you in making an impact on that. So rather than it seems to be almost all of the things that are proposed we can do in terms of revenue raising are charges which we can put on households essentially on an individual. So that seems to be, you know, people talk about the tough decisions. I mean, maybe not tough for people sitting around this table because we're not going to be at a food bank as a consequence of whether they're tough for an awful lot of other people. Uh, so uh, I think that, yes, I think there's a case to be made. What I would like to do in that regard is to uh, discuss establishing a commission uh, to, uh, to get people to look into that, to bring back a report, uh, which the executive can, and obviously the assembly can consider. Uh, which says, yes, if, if we had these powers aligned to our programme for government objectives, these are some of the ways that they could be used. I, I think that th th there is an argument also to have powers, and then you can decide then how and when uh, to use them as well. So we are restricted in terms of the, the uh, ability to actually influence uh, the direction of our economy and the, the uh, I suppose, the generation of revenue to assist us with public services by the, by the limited levers we have. And just so I'm clear on that, the Commission you see as being separate from the Council? Yes. Which is, yeah. yeah. Uh, 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 ultimately, I think whatever powers that we exercise, the limited ones we have now, are if we're able and agree and, and are able then to get those transfers and more words. And the Fiscal Council has a role in overseeing that and working with the Executive to make sure that they're used appropriately and to the best outcome. And on the Fiscal Council, I appreciate the Permanent Secretary said the teams are providing work, but I'm going to abuse my privilege as a member to make spec ask those speculative questions about what it might look like in suggestions. Um, would you foresee it having a, um, an economic forecasting role in addition to purely fiscal controls? If you look at, for example, the UBR, um, the UBR has an economic and fiscal outlook which it publishes twice a year, um, both, uh, both around the budget and autumn statement or whatever the fiscal events are. Um, in a sense, the principle there is that you can't make a serious fiscal judgment without 
rigorous economic forecasts and uh, you know across a kind of four or five year profile is that something you'd want to look at and would you you know would you see that being properly staffed by independent economists well and that and that almost kind of strains into the department of economy's function as well so that means in the working out of this we have to be we have to tease this out not only within the department of finance but across the executive uh, i think there is an argument for that because one of the issues we have is we don't have the data available to do proper economic forecasts, and there is no Northern Ireland economic model in which you can actually build in data and then say, if we if we alter that piece, what would the effect be in the local economies? We don't have that. Treasury holds some of that data, so you need a discussion with them in relation to it. Obviously, the Department of Economy has a, has a significant role in terms of that. So, <coughs> yes, I think if, if we want to try and make a change, if we want to grow the economy, we're trying to want to grow the revenue available to us to provide decent public services, then we need to have the data, we need to have the personnel who can interpret and forecast on the back of that. But at the moment you have various people off doing their own thing and it is on a limited uh, information flow. Uh, so certainly I think uh, whether that's the job of a fiscal council or whether that's a, a separate entity that's advising the executive or doing forecasting for the executive, I'm, I'm quite relaxed. We, we only basically have a line in the document which says there will be a fiscal council. I think that's a discussion we all collectively need to have as to how it functions and what, what services it provides to the executive and the assembly. And is that something you w w plan to raise with the Treasury? And can you, I, I can't see why they would be, well, I'm sure there's always a reason why the Treasury resists as a former Treasury official, but. Um, uh, you know, could I suggest, or do you think you will bring that to the Treasury early on and kind of give them a kind of clear steer that that's where you'd like to go with this? Yes, uh, absolutely. That's where I would like to go with it. Uh, I, I think, I mean, if, we're, if we were to have a fiscal council, if we were to have proper economic forecasts, and uh, we have had economic policy here uh, for a number of years, which has no analysis of yeah, how mm -hmm. the economy is performed or what the economy generates, so it's, it's kind of done blind, yeah. which isn't, isn't the way we need to do things. <coughs> uh, so if we want to have that, uh, it has to be based on proper data, and the Treasury hold quite a lot of that. Yes, and, uh, yes, absolutely. I'd want to be talking to the Treasury in the first instance about ensuring that we have access to the data that we need. Good. I'm glad you've got, got that on the record here first, uh, Minister. I just had another question as well, and, it's, and it might not be one that you're able to provide an answer for today, but um, in, the, in the NDNA document there were some um, in addition to UK government spending commitments or some Irish government spending commitments, I just wonder if you have some th sort of, <coughs> is there a sense that that's in progress, that we have any kind of, you know, that the, that the election that's happening is, you know, do we have any doubt around that or, or well, are we on that, I suppose? I mean, the government, uh, the Irish government were prepared as part of the document to put in the figures mm -hmm. that they were committing to us. Uh, the NIO were more reticent, and I sort of understand why. Uh, but so uh, I, I mean we've spoken to Taoiseach on the, the Tanisha since, and they absolutely stand over the commitments that they made. There, there are some more vague propositions within this, which I think need to be teased. And obviously, one of the first uh, things I was going to do was going to meet the finance minister Pascal Donahue, and the the doll was. Uh, the election was called, and so uh, we, we're, it obviously has to wait for the next couple of weeks until a, a new government is formed in the south, and then we pick up that discussion with them. But one of the more vague propositions was the idea of a kind of border community fund, which doesn't have any flesh attached to it, so we'd want a discussion around that. Uh, but any of the other items that they committed to actual spend for, we saw the figures, they say they're standing over those figures, and, and obviously we'd want an incoming government to honour that, that commitment. I just had one other question, if that's all right, Chair, mm -hmm. to, um, which is, again, on the financial transactions um, capital side. Um, it would be good to just, in a sense, elaborate a bit more on what we talked about earlier on. My understanding was, and correct me if this is wrong, that this, a lot of this money initially came as a kind of a consequential from help to buy in about 2013, mm -hmm. if that's right. Was it, <coughs> in addition to the housing associations, um, who, and obviously the legislation didn't happen at Westminster that would have made them accessing that financing easier. What are the other areas that could have but didn't seek to access that money? Maybe you want to yeah. like this? Mm. It's sort of easier to talk about the areas that did than the areas which could have and didn't, because right. obviously if we had known where they could have, we would have tried to have encouraged that's, that. That's a fair point. <laughs> <laughs> so and definitely. Yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah, exactly. So there has been a range. Invest and I make use of it for a range of, of schemes. So they have agri-food loan schemes, growth loan funds, other projects. Northern Ireland Science Park has made use of it. Um, some funding out for sustainable use of poultry litter and through health for GP premises. There's Affordable home loans and obviously the co-ownership housing was a yep. key one of that. 
and there have also have been loans to the University of Ulster and Queen's University. Okay. And then we have put a hundred million into the Northern Ireland Investment Fund. So there has been use of it, but but the difficulty is, as Sue elaborated earlier, mm. in just getting those projects where departments are happy to take the risk around them <coughs> and where recipients are glad are happy to take loans as opposed to grants for that as well. And um, some of that, if you'll indulge me, Chair, mm. was some of that because you mentioned capability inside departments. So is some of that because is it about capability? Or is it a capability and the fact that there weren't ministers there to take a degree of risk in signing off, obviously, in the last three years? Or is it both? It's probably a bit of both. There is an element where we're asking departments who don't have that commercial or market expertise to assess risk around loans. And we're asking them yeah. to do that and take on the risk if they don't have that market or commercial ability to do that. Then there is identifying, obviously, departments are used to grant funding and getting money out in that way. It's identifying new opportunities. And as well as taking the risk around managing the loan, there's also the setting of the interest rates if the aid applies. So it's not often that the FTC loans will actually be at beneficial rates, often they'll be at market rates. So there, there, there may be a reluctance for uptake on that as well. So there's a range of issues there. There, there are some structural issues in mm -hmm. terms of departments having the various to actually do it or else to kind of assess the projects and pass it on to SIB and TEO right. complete. So there, there are a range of issues yeah. in around. There's a, there's a piece of work to do here mm -hmm. to yeah. actually, um, you know, it, it's a great it's great to have this uh, mm -hmm. available, mm -hmm. and when there is a piece of work to do to see how we can get departments to be, yeah. I suppose, innovative, um, but also have the you know bring forward projects and actually have open discussions about them. Uh, is it um, this might be ignorance, but is it right to say that if the FTC money came initially for as a consequential from Help to buy splurge that happened. The splurge that helped to buy the big financial transaction that went on balance sheet in about 2013-14. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is that? I think I'm right in saying in GB it stops. Tell to buy stopping next year. Is that right? 21, 22. Yeah. Oh, does that mean it would be a bit fair to expect that there'd be less FTC money? We honestly can't say it at this point in time. The FTC, we, we thought at a point in time it was going to tail off. It hasn't. It has actually ramped up in some way. We won't know until the spending review, until we see what the allocations are to Whitehall departments right. and what those consequences. We do, as you'd say, just get consequentials of that spending. But it, it has mostly been helped to buy, has it, or, but not exclusively? Not exclusively. Sorry, Joanne, just to, just to digress that you said it ramped up. Well, we, we thought it was going to tail off at a point in time, but actually it kept, it kept coming or it kept coming at slightly higher levels. So it is very much in the same way we get all our funding through Barnet Consequentials mm -hmm. from allocations to Whitehall Departments, so we have no, absolutely no control over the so amount of funding. So it's it still out there. We thought it was an, an, an avenue that was going there. to close, but it's still there. It's so still we there. need to encourage them to yeah. go out and... Oh, yeah. oh, yes, definitely. definitely. Right. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Jim? Uh, thank you, Chair. A couple of issues, if I might. Uh, Minister, you referred in your opening remarks to the expectation in the new approach document to a commitment to greater transparency. In fact, the words of the document are a commitment to greater transparency aimed at securing and maintaining public confidence. And a specific of that it was to strengthen special advisor codes. Why then did you weaken the Special Advisor Code on appointments on transparency? Okay. Well, the, uh, I, I, I don't want to preempt the outcome of the inquiry and I don't want to make direct reference, but the, 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 I think in the public view of this, criticism was that ministers appeared to be going through an exercise in terms of appointment which is expected and was, wasn't actually happening. Uh, so the question then, I think, in terms of when the parties were looking at this code, was do we go through an exercise or do we just make accountability and responsibility more apparent and more, uh, I suppose, laid down in terms of the code for the minister who has appointed that person, rather than trying to rely on some exercise where people have gone off and conducted interviews and perhaps advertised. There's nothing to stop any minister if they want to go and advertise the post for special advisor, they want to conduct interviews and record the interviews, where the interest of the department picks up is when the minister brings a name to them and says, I want to appoint this person, and then the Department of Finance has a role in terms of an assessment of the CV of that person. Yes, but the old code had the civics which were props to transparency, like 
the Minister was required to, to consider a pool of candidates, which must be broadly based. The selection had to be, uh, the Minister's reasons for his selection had to be recorded. Each stage of the recruitment process had to be recorded and retained for at least a year with corporate HR. You stripped all that out. Now, your reason for stripping all that out seems to have been because people like Jonathan Bell ignored it, were simply handed a spad rather than making any selection from a pool of candidates. People like your predecessor uh, got into trouble with the RHI inquiry because he tried to pretend that he had consulted someone to be a spad and then that someone came along and said, he never asked me. So your response to the past <coughs> breaches of the code is simply to validate that situation by no longer requiring any of those transparent acts. Surely that's weakening and a backward step. Well, it would not be more important to enforce rather than to validate the breach. Well, it depends where you see the, the greater need for transparency and accountability. Uh, I think the, the greater, I suppose, attention paid to this in terms of the inquiry was in the activities of a special advisor while in office. The uh, responsibility they had to a minister or not, as the case may be, was, was, was a grey area. The issue of a minister setting the pay for their own special advisor. Uh, these were areas that we felt needed strengthened as a consequence of the emerging uh, discussion from the RHI inquiry. Of course, the RHI inquiry may mm. invite us to revisit but the issues that you're raising, and if that's the case, we certainly will yes, revisit yes, them. Yes, but I remind you, Lord Justice Cochran was very taken yeah. with the flagrant breach yeah. of the Code of Appointment. He came back to it many, many times because it was <laughs> so stark. I just don't understand within a context where there is uh, an exhortation to strengthen the codes, to give greater transparency, that your response to that is to strip out the very components of transparency and to validate the very wrongdoing so as it can happen again. There's nothing now under your code which would stop a Jonathan Bell or a Martian O'Mullier doing what they did. And you have validated that and said that's okay under the guise of transparency. It's the very opposite. Well, I would argue with you, and as I say, if the RHI inquiry makes some specific recommendations, I'm happy to revisit. But I would argue that the greater issue was the behaviour of spe some special advisors, and not all special advisors, yeah. some special advisors in office, the accountability that they had <laughs> to their own minister uh, and the responsibility that that minister had for their behaviour. And that is all made very specifically uh, enforced in the new code, yes. including as well the decision in relation to the pay afforded to a special yes. advisor has been taken out of the hands of the minister. But I'm, fo I'm focused on, <laughs> I know on the Code of Appointments, yes, yes, and I the Code of Appointments is something you have watered down. And, you know, I'm sure the public don't need reminded that these are public appointments to public positions paid by public money. And yet the one post across the public sector that you can be gifted without any record being kept, any process whatsoever being recorded, any consideration of others out of a pool of candidates, the one post in the public sector that you can now be appointed to is a special advisor, courtesy of the weakening that you have delivered on the Code of Appointment. Well, you think that's meeting the expectation of yeah. public in terms well, of transparency? Can I say, I, I bring Sue in now, the, the question is, uh, the special advisor is a different appointment than they become a temporary civil servant, but they are in, sense, in essence a political appointment. It has, oh, to be someone that, servant. it has to be someone that a minister is, well, is, is comfortable with. Not that. Yeah, well, then the question is, are we more concerned with how they get there or what they do when they are there? And Both? For, for, for me, the, the, the bigger focus uh, in relation to inquiry has been in relation to... It's not, uh, not mutually exclusive. Well, you can have both. Uh, as I say, if the inquiry makes a recommendation in relation to it, I'm happy to revisit it. Uh, but my concern <coughs> in terms of getting 
uh, the appointments made within the very quick time frame that we had to get special advisors in place was to ensure that once appointed, the lines of accountability were very, very clear for them. Just, um, I mean, obviously, in developing this uh, new code um, and the contract, I mean, obviously, we did a lot of work in the working group. We actually looked at the other jurisdictions, and so a lot of the words that strengthen the code have come from what's in place in the other jurisdictions. In the Sorry, other... it doesn't strengthen the code of appointment. No, no. But... I know you want to talk about the code of no, conduct. No, no, I don't actually. The code of no, 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 no. I'm really happy. It. Well, what I was going to say is that in the other jurisdictions. People, the other, they recognise the relationship between the special advisor and the minister. They recognise that it is a personal appointment and that actually a minister can make the decision as to who they want to appoint. They give that name to the civil service and then the contract is put in place. And so what we're saying is what happens behind the scenes before then, that is a matter for the appointing minister. It's at the point then they, they provide the name to us and then we go forward. With respect, Ms Gray, other jurisdictions have not had a public inquiry exposing the scandal of special advisors well, I think in many has, regards. Well, I can think of, uh, you know, there has been the odd public inquiry that has looked into the activities of special advisors mm. in, you know... Mm. So, so, so do you dissent from my summation that your answer to the wrongdoing in terms of the use of the old code on appointments was, is now simply to validate that so you don't have to submit anything to scrutiny. Well, Isn't that a fair summation? We are given, we are given the name of who the minister oh, wants to appoint. Yeah, you're given the name, yeah. but you don't have to keep what you used to have to keep, a note of why, a note of the process, uh, and the fact that other candidates were considered, like the old uh, scheme had a tick box exercise where the minister had to answer the questions, have I a clear idea of the requirements of the job and the person to do it? Have I created a wide enough candidate field? <coughs> have I selected unjustifiable grounds from the pool of candidates? Has the character check vetting process been completed? Have I a written record at all stages of the appointment and selection processes? All one might have thought in the interest of transparency, very fair questions. But are now liquidated, removed. Ar arguably, then, a minister could tick those boxes and say... And did. And, and did. And then when it came to the behaviour of a special advisor in the inquiry, they said they were responsible but not accountable. Yes, uh, look, so you'll get no arguably, argument... Which is a greater from, transgression. No, you'll get no argument from me of the abuse of the code, of the appalling behaviour of, of Jonathan Bell and others. Uh, no argument whatsoever. But that... Instead of addressing that mischief, you simply seek to remove the mischief by removing the requirements. Because we want to place the responsibility very firmly and squarely on the shoulders the of the minister. can now do anything. He can pick, he can yeah. pick, and they will he can pick his daughter, he can pick his and they will wife, answer. he can pick anyone. They will answer for that. Uh, well, well, sorry, Minister Jim. I mean, if the, the same, through if, the, if through the the same, same requirement was put into the, the staff that perhaps MLA is appointed, then we could, have, we could have another discussion in relation to that in terms of picking their family members. But the issue sorry, here... MLAs have to advertise their posts. Fair enough. Yeah. There seems to be a, 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 a very fortunate family members who fit the bill uh, time and time again. But that aside, the responsibility is very clearly on a minister now, where perhaps in the, depart in the inquiry it wasn't so clear in the minister. So however the minister arrives at the appointment, they are responsible for the special advisor. The special advisor has had the code in terms of their own behaviour strengthened. And there will be further strengthening of the codes of the Northern Ireland Civil Service of which the special <coughs> advisor becomes a temporary uh, civil servant. There will be further strengthening of the ministerial codes in relation to their own responsibilities. Uh, as I say, this is done in anticipation, uh, or, or anticipation that there may well be further issues which arise from the inquiry which require further work uh, in yeah. terms of its recommendations. And if that's the case, then these can be revisited. Chair, could raise one final point? Yes. Um, <coughs> you very frankly said that the only new money under the new approach is 760 million. That's from our estimation of Yes. Uh, and the, the expectation of requirement runs into billions. It was evident from reading the document, was it not, 
that there was no uh, guarantee on the cash. There was no figures against anything. So is it a fair observation to say that you and the other parties signed up to the agreement blind as far as the money was concerned? Well, I think it would be fair to say that from our perspective, in terms of negotiation, I can only speak on behalf of my own party and not the other parties. We hadn't concluded the negotiation. Uh, the two governments went out and published the document unannounced to anyone else. But then you accepted it. Well, we, the, the question in that, and I don't doubt that's the way it was framed, uh, mm. I mean, our primary concern in it was the political side of the document and whether it was sufficient in that in terms of, re of, of re-entering these institutions, which we concluded there was. The, uh, the expectation that you talk about created was not through the submission of wish lists on behalf of the parties, but <coughs> carefully worked out document between all of the party representatives, senior civil servants, senior people in the NIO, uh, in which we were given a very reasonable expectation that this was the, uh, this was the expectation that would, would be met. Uh, so the fact that the government is not as forthcoming as they had promised to be, uh, is something that we intend to continue to pursue with them. But we didn't all sit down, as, certainly as far as our party's concerned, sit down and agree a document and say we're good to go, go publish it. A document was published with no forewarning to the parties on a take-it-or-leave-it basis. Uh, finally, Chair, could I ask Ms Gray, all the, what's called the wish list, the wish list issues in the agreement, will all those be subject to a business case? your department? Not. I mean, what we're, what we're currently doing is we are going through this exercise where we are costing, uh, we're getting departments to tell us what the costs are of the various initiatives. And then we have an exercise to do where we will, you know, prioritise those, uh, the, those commitments. Um, and obviously at the stage when, uh, you know, departments want to bring them forward, they will be subject as appropriate to a business case. Well, as appropriate, or are they oh. not always appropriate? No, no, business. they would always be appropriate <coughs> if, there was, if they were below the delegation level. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes, I understand so, that. But they will, of course, be subject to a business case. Which has to demonstrate value for money. Yeah. Thank you. And that's why the issues that were in the document were carefully discussed worked through with senior officials yeah. in the Department of Finance, the head of the civil service, <coughs> and senior officials in the Northern Ireland <coughs> office. But not costed? Not, not, not costed uh, yeah. at, the, at this particular yeah. stage. Thank you. We, had, we had some costs, so I should say we did have some costs of some of them, but actually not the whole package. Okay, thank you, sir. Matthew, just share. a very quick follow-up. Yeah, I did a really quick point of information. Um, it's actually just on, the, on RHI, just so we covered it. Before. Um, um, your department is the sponsor department of the inquiry. Um, there's a lot of sort of the different messages about when we might getting, be getting a report. Just for clarity, your, will your department be the first to find out from Sir Patrick Cochran on when it's actually happening and what's your understanding of the process for telling the Assembly and the public? Well, uh, <coughs> the previous finance minister, uh, when he set up the inquiry, uh, had, had written to the chair to say that he didn't in order to remove any perception of political interference. Mm -hmm. He didn't want to be the recipient of the report whenever it was finally arrived at. Uh, and so I have written to the Chair of the Inquiry in, in, since I took up office to confirm that that's my position as well. So when the report is made available, it would be passed to Hsu and uh, whatever other appropriate officials there are in the department and then will be disseminated at, uh, uh, through whatever... Sure. I can say agree, which yeah. I won't have any role in at all. So, the, um, it's, so it's been agreed by your predecessor that the chairman of the inquiry will publish the report. He will be responsible for publishing it. Um, so we don't have an exact, you know, we don't have a date, and we don't have the detailed arrangements. But he will be publishing the report. We would get, as with other inquiries, an advance copy. But as the minister has said, that will not be shared. That will be on a very small uh, list. That's not the maximisation bit. That's no, no, just that's the, all done. That's all this done. is just the normal <coughs> process that you would get. And how, how, how long would you normally get it in advance? It will all depend. I mean, it's normally um, 24 or 48 hours. It's not, it's not a huge uh, amount of time. Um, but, I mean, the chairman will be responsible. There'll obviously be liaison with the assembly authorities about the date and about the arrangements. Um, I don't know what those arrangements will be, 
um, and having not done an inquiry report here, um, I don't know whether it's different, um, but that's the sort of thing that you have to work through. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Sean? Thank you, Chair. Thanks for the presentation. At the outset, Connor, you said that the Treasury meeting was productive. Could you expand on that? Were they loosening the push strings on the senior common or, <laughs> or what? It, it, it wasn't uh, uh, <laughs> It wasn't that, that type of... What we wanted to have a discussion was that the Chief Secretary of the Treasury is, is the person responsible for dispersal, if you like, of the... Matthew of the money Matthew. across the, the various uh, departments and regions. Uh, and so we wanted to ensure uh, that he had an understanding of of the documents, of what the expectations were, of what our particular requirements are, of the unique circumstances that we face, because we, we understand that austerity has had an impact on many English constituencies and mm -hmm. on Scotland and Wales as well as us, uh, but of some of the unique circumstances that we face. So it was, it was that kind of high-level discussion. What we wanted uh, was a commitment from them to continue the dialogue with us, uh, that the costing exercise which Sue and the department have undertaken in collaboration with all of the other executive departments uh, would complete and, and then we would be in a position to go back to them and talk to them about the specific commitments that were made in it. So it was essentially to establish uh, that the negotiation hadn't closed down, uh, that it would continue and that we had a job more to do and to go back uh, to the Treasury uh, when that was done and, and to begin a more substantive discussion on the actual figures. Yeah, and um, in terms of what it would bring back public services to sustainable level, have we kind of a figure on that? Well, that's the kind of exercise yeah. that we're doing. Uh, I mean, there was a very, uh, it was a rough estimate in, in terms of what it would be required. Uh, the, the, the initial figure that came out was 1.5 billion over the next five to seven years to bring our, our public finances back uh, to put them on a fully sustainable basis. Uh, but the, that's in general terms. Uh, what we were looking to do then was the issues that were identified in the document provide costings against. Some of those are difficult to cost because they involve programmes and strategies which sometimes are cross-departmental, yeah. so they aren't that uh, easily costed. Uh, but where an accurate costing can be given, that's, that's the work that we're undertaking to do in the next week or so. Okay, okay. Sure. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, Gemma, sorry. Okay, thanks, Chair, and thanks to the team for coming along. I have one, just one question. It might actually be more for Sue than it's for Connor. Um, it's just around the Dormant Accounts Fund. Yeah. I think did the consultation close at Christmas? It did, and in fact, I've had a meeting this morning on okay. it. Um, so uh, the Community Lottery Fund have been uh, undertaking the consultation, yeah. um, and I have to say, I think they've done an actually great job. Yeah. You know, they've been uh, they've done road shows, they've done consultation events, they've had a number of written responses, and the next step will then be for them to come back to us now. Yeah, with the outcome of that con the consultation responses and also their strategic plan, which will be laid in the assembly, and hopefully that will be um, you know soon. Soon. Okay. Um, so I think that is really good news. That's They've brilliant. Done yeah, a very good great. piece of work. Yeah, they have. Yeah, that's brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Minister Permsnack and uh, John, thank you very much today. Just thank you. just to look at uh, just before we go, you've got a lot to do by Easter. Pardon. Um, Fiscal Council. A lot to do before Easter. Is there, yeah. <laughs> when is Easter this year? Fiscal, fiscal, Council, <laughs> fiscal Council, you've said yourself, and given yep. evidence that they've yep. done it in the next yep. couple of weeks, yep. which to me means Box by. Options. Yes. Yeah, which to me means before Easter, and we'd like some updates on this. Ministerial codes. Yep. Uh, the NDNA costings. Yeah. The budget line. Uh, and thanks very much indeed for the, the copy of the first day brief. We'll see that fairly soon. Uh, updates on the financial tra transactions capital funding with uh, to make sure that the other departments are up to speed on that. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a lot to do in a very short mm -hmm. period of time. And a budget bill. And a budget bill. <laughs> yes, uh, you haven't quite got to the bottom and of rates. it. And rates. <laughs> yeah, and rates and the rest of it. Yeah. Um, we appreciate sort of... I understand you have LPS in next week, is it? Yes, we... Yeah, uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Get a very detailed... Uh, they've more detailed discussion. They've got a lot of good work going on. Yeah. yeah. Yes, we appreciate the sort of the openness, and we want this to continue in a yeah. spread of openness and transparency. But we would like to be kept fully informed of how we're progressing <coughs> on these significant issues. Uh, just a final one from me, just before we go as well. Um, obviously, with the opportunity to uh, talk to Treasury, have you reached out to the other regional administrations yet? Have you reached out to the Scots and the Welsh yet? Not, not as yet. Uh, we haven't had the opportunity. Uh, I know there was a, a meeting yesterday, which. I think it was yesterday the first yeah. deputy first minister at with the, the other institutions were represented. But my intention is uh, 
I've been hit with an election in the South, so I haven't had an opportunity because the, the, the finance minister in the South is directly involved in terms of the document and the outcome of the document. Uh, but yes, my intention is that, that as soon as I possibly can to reach out to the Welsh and the uh, Scottish finance ministers and have some dialogue with them. Because we nearly got through this entire briefing session without using the B word, but we're into Brexit. The uh, United Kingdom leaves the EU at the end of this week. We've got 11 months to go of the so-called transition period, and there are significant changes that need to be put in place for Northern Ireland to be ready for 0101 2021. So again, that underpins, well, that underpins all the sort of degree of the work that needs to be done as well. Yeah. But thank you both. Well, thank you all three of you very much indeed for you. coming and talking to us. And thank, thank you. you. Okay. Well. Good to meet you. Okay. Okay. All best. And we'll take a short two-minute yes. break. Suspend. Yeah, suspend. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 
29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is okay, ladies and gentlemen, if we can, uh, a bit of hush and we can sort of uh, crack on. Just before we do that, um, one of the things that, because we've got all this issue to do with the rates, and uh, particularly next week, I uh, would like to encourage the organisations who have written to the committee to engage with the department at an early stage, particularly on non-domestic rates, and to provide information on some of the actual issues. And I think that was quite clear from the conversation that Pat, thank you very much indeed for leading on, particularly around sort of the hospitality trade and the rest of it. Are we agreed to that? Yeah. Great. Thank you, Mr. And could we invite? Uh, Come and join us, please, Emma and Stephen. Right, team and I, we're doing a departmental evidence session now on pensions and subordinate legislation. <coughs> and may I welcome sort of uh, Stephen, who's the Deputy Principal of Policy and Legislation, Civil Service Pensions. And Emma, I, and please correct me if I got this wrong, that your pensions public service policy. Yes, that's correct. That's it. Okay. Actually, Chair, we're both from that branch. Okay, thank you very much, Steve. I'd like to draw the a member's attention to the clerk's paper, uh, paper at page 43, which provides a helpful summary of the SRs received between 2017 and 2019 relating to pensions. I would like to draw your attention to the department, department letter to update the Committee for Finance and Public Service Pension Statutory Rules outstanding from January 2017, and that's at page 46. Of your papers, you're looking a bit. I am looking a bit sceptical because all these upgrades have been made. The pensioners are in receipt of the what's been granted. So what's the purpose of this exercise? Sure, it, it is just to to, to formally uh, agree the SRs. So They're already in. They've been implemented. <coughs> 
Or am I wrong about that? They've all been implemented. The Earl of George, yes. Yeah. What are we doing? I think originally, Chair, we probably were proposing to give a more broad brief on priorities, and there may have been a change in the timetable, but we were scheduled to give a review of the statutory rules that had been made. Chair, if I may. Yes. The, um, these these uh, SRs are still within the 30-day rule, so the committee has the opportunity, if there was anything wrong with them, to annul them. It is in many ways a formality, but there may be issues that members have, and uh, the Secretary it, it just can't, can't ignore that. It has, to, it has to be gone through. I think that is the answer. We shall continue. Uh, may I draw attention to the members' attention to statute rules at agenda items 6 to 11, and they are subject to the Assembly's negative resolution procedure. Uh, the remaining statutory rules and the final item to the Principal Civil Service Pension Scheme are not subject to the Assembly proceedings. I'd like to inform the members that the examiner's statutory rules has informally indicated that the first three statutory rules will be reported without comment, so that's 2017-29, uh, 2017-30 and 2018-63. I'd also like to inform the members that the examiner statutory rule has informally indicated the following statutory rules will be drawn to the attention of the Assembly in <coughs> breach of the 21-day rule, which is statutory rule 2018-62, statutory rule 2018-71, statutory rule 2019-60 but is content that the Department has provided a satisfactory explanation for the breach in this instant. Okay. Be useful in the yeah. um, I'd like to inform the members that the oral evidence is the Committee's opportunity to raise any issues or concerns they may have in relation to the statutory rules and agenda item before formal consideration of the statutory rules. Um, Stephen Emma, would you care to make a statement? Um, I I can give an overview of the purpose of these rules, if that would be useful. That would be say. useful. Yeah. Um, so since uh, 2015, the majority of public service pensioners, sorry, public service uh, workers, are members of new career average pension schemes. Um, those schemes revalue benefits uh, every year. Um, the Department of Finance has a responsibility to make an order to define the, the, the parameters of how they are defined with reference to prices or earnings. Um, the revaluation orders that you have before you deal with that issue. The other pension uh, review you ordered that you'll see on, on your papers relates to the operating of pensions and payment and fair pensions from the 1st of April each year. Um, similarly, the Department has a responsibility under the Social Security uh, Benefits 1975 Northern Ireland order to, to make an order once this, the Department for Communities has made an order to operate official pensions and benefits we make a similar order to operate official pensions for public servants by the same percentage amount and with reference to prices. Okay. Okay, Any questions? Thank you very much indeed for coming before the committee. Thank you. <laughs> well done. I think that will probably be one of the shortest opportunities that you have. But thank you very much indeed. And thank you very much indeed for making your time. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, we'll be uh, looking forward to seeing you again on the 12th of February, I think. Questions will be attended on 12th of February and give a review of our priorities. Okay. Uh, team, are we happy for this to content to be added to the forward work programme? Mm -hmm. All those in favour say aye. 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 Right, here we go. Team, uh, statutory rules at page 51, statutory rule 2017 uh, slash 29, the Public Service Pensions Revaluation Prices Order Northern Ireland 2017. Any comments from the members? If we're content then, the committee has considered statutory rule 2017-29, the public service pensions revaluation prices order in Northern Ireland 2017, and subject to the examiner's statutory rules report, has no objection to the rule. Any objections? No. no. Well, uh, page 59. Could we not take them in bulk? 
And you're going to sit there reading those out for the next and 15 so minutes. Unfortunately, they do have to. Uh, the the Jim, you know as well as I do, they have to. Come on. I mean, if I was a lawyer, I'd be getting triple time for this. <laughs> At page 59, Statutes Rule 2017-30, the Public Service Pensions Revaluation Earnings Order, Northern Ireland 2017. Any comments? Nope. No. All those agreed? Agreed. Agreed. The Committee has considered Statutes Rule 2017-30, the Public Service Pensions Revaluation Earnings Order in Northern Ireland 2017, and subject to the examiner's statutory rules report has no objection to the rule. No objections? No. no. Page 64, Statutes Rule 2017-63, the Pensions Increase Modification Regulations, Northern Ireland 2017. Any comments? No. The Committee has considered Statutes Rule 2017 63, the Pensions Increase Modification Regulations, Northern Ireland 2017, and subject to the Examiner's Statutory Rules Reports, has no objection to the rule. Great. 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 At page 75, Statutes Rule 2018 62, the Public Service Pensions Revaluation Order, Northern Ireland 2018, the regulations were made on the 22nd of March 2018 laid on the 22nd of March 2018 and came into operation on the 1st of April 2018. Any comments from the members? The committee has considered standing as such as real 2018-62, the Public Service Pensions Revaluation Order Northern Ireland 2018, and subject to the examiner of statutory rules reports, are there any objections? No. Agreed. At page 92, statutory rule 2019, 2019-71, the Public Service Pensions Revaluation Order, Northern Ireland 2019. Any comments? The Committee has considered Statutes Rule 2019-71, the Public Service Pensions Revaluation Order, Northern Ireland 2019, and subject to the examiner of statutory rules report, have we any objections? No. no. At page 102, Statutory Rule 2019-60, the Public Service, Civil Servants and Others Pensions Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2019. Any comments? The Committee has considered Statutes Rule 2019-60, the Public Service Pensions Revaluation Order, Northern Ireland 2019, and subject to the Examiner Statutes Rule Report, does anybody have any objections to the rule? No. no. I would like to draw the Member's attention to the, f the following uh, statutory rules which cover Agenda Items 12 to 14, and we find from pages 115 to 152. I'd like to draw your attention to the fact that these uh, statutory rules are not subject to Assembly proceedings, and I'm asking members to note these statutory rules unless they have any issues to raise. Do we have any issues to raise? No. Great. At page 115, Statutory Rule 2017-64, Pensions Increase Review Order, Northern Ireland 2017, I'm asking the members to note. Do we so note? Yes. Um, good. At page 130, Statutory Rule 2018-63, Pensions Increase Review Order, Northern Ireland 2018. This rule supersedes Statutory Rule 2017-64. I'm asking members to note. Do we so note? No. Note. At page 139, Statutory Rule 2019-70, Pensions Increase Review Order, Northern Ireland 2019, which commenced on the 8th of April 2019. This rule supersedes Statutory Rule 2017-63. I'm asking the members to note. Do we so note? Noted. Next item on the agenda, page 153, the Principal Civil Service Pension, the Principal Civil Service Pension Scheme, Principal Civil Service Pension Scheme Amendment Scheme, Northern Ireland 2019. I would like to inform members the amendment scheme is not subject to assembly control. However, Article 48 of the Superannuation Northern Ireland Order 1972 provides that before a scheme comes into operation, the Department shall lay a copy of the scheme before the Assembly. Has that been done? Yes, Chair. Okay. Yeah. I'm asking you to note. So noted. Uh, next item on the agenda is re research requests regarding matters of conscience for registrars in relation to same-sex marriage. I uh, remind members from the meeting of the 22nd of January it was agreed to consider at today's meeting that proposals that the committee commission research from raise regarding matters of conscience for registrars in relation to same-sex marriage. Anybody wish to make any comment? 
Could I just add, this was Jim's proposal, uh, he's not in the room at present, but could I just say that as members of this committee, I think it's very important that if we have, as individuals have any aspect or concern, that we should be able to use the means at our disposal here, especially if it's finance department related, which this certainly is. And I would have no I would have no problems whatsoever but with any member of this committee asking for uh, research on any given <coughs> subject or topic, even if it's something that I know that at a policy position and a political party political position I would be opposed to the member on. I think it's just a good practice and principle that we as finance committee members, we as a team, can uh, trust members to ask for and receive research on any given subject as long as it's finance department driven. Uh, uh, thanks. Uh, but we also heard uh, when we asked the question that any of us as individuals can do that. So that right is open to us as individuals. So I believe that that would be the proper route in order to take for this. Uh, I, the Chairman, I, I, mean, I, would, I would add to that and I would you know, put on record respect for um, the differing views on this issue that probably um, Paul and other members of the committee have. But another point I would make is that um, uh, we've heard today the massive interest the Department of Finance has. We've talked repeatedly in this committee about how much we have to do in terms of scrutinising, building public trust. I think if the first, leaving aside the, the material of the issue, which I don't agree with either, but irrespective of that, if the very first thing we as a the very first bit of research we as a committee commission is on something that most something that most people don't wouldn't even think of as a as a as a finance issue, I think it would look strange. So I with respect would um second what Pat just said. I can add I'm sorry. Sorry. Mm. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, Jim. Well I'm disappointed to hear what Matthew says because I would have thought, particularly a party that prides itself in its history of upholding human rights and would have some concern for employees who applied for and secured a job which was compatible with their conscience and the religious belief, and then find that over their heads there is such a radical change in their terms and conditions that they are required to do something which conflicts with their conscience and wholly conflicts with the religious views that they have. This committee might utterly uh, disagree with those views. But I can tell you there are people in that position. And this, if this committee cares nothing for those people as a decision not to advance this matter would indicate, then I think that is a sad day and a hypocritical day for some. You just can't believe in rights when the issue suits you. If you have a right, you have a right. And therefore, I think the selectivity that would simply brush under the carpet consideration of an issue such as this, because it doesn't fit with the worldview of members of this committee. I think that's a very poor way for those who champion the cause of minorities to now conduct themselves. Mm. Um, I would like to sort of make a comment here as the chair, but this is a this is my perspective, not as the chair's perspective, but as the rest of it. Is my is my perspective and I as you can imagine from the conversation we had last week, it came as a surprise that this came within the purview of the committee. And I hear clearly what Matthew and Pat says, and I'd imagine what's other views around this as well. But there is a fact here that it is of an issue. And it's a question of using a resource that we have, which is worth the raise to do it. And now, putting my chair hat on, I will give a considerable degree of latitude to members of this committee for particular areas of research. That areas are within the wider aspects of the Finance Committee. 
Standfast sort of our particular views, and my views would not be aligned with Jim's or with Paul's on, on many of these issues. <coughs> but I think in this situation, that is a, it is an issue that should be brought forward. It, given the resource that we have within RAISE, the RAISE capability of doing that it has been raised within the table, I would like this to be a matter of consensus within the committee. And But if it's not, if we do not feel this is a position of consensus, I will, I will put it to the vote. But I think in these circumstances, because as chair, I will give as much latitude as possible to members as we go forward in areas that are of research. I think that's uh, an aspect I would like us to reflect on. Sorry, Paul. Yes, Chair, thank you. Thank you for letting me in again on a second go on this. Are members seriously saying that if there is an inkling that there is a problem in any aspect of the Department of Finance, that we don't want to learn more about it? And, and on Matthew's point, after the debate last week, there was three research papers commissioned from this department, I think. Three. And nobody batted an eyelid. Nobody disagreed. And are we really saying that when a member of this committee asks and requests for more information, that we're going to oppose that? That's what we're down to, Gemma. Sorry, Chair. Can I just make a comment? Yeah, the member might want more information on it, but as we have alluded to on several occasions, the member can go by himself and get the paper commissioned. So, it does not paper. have to be the, the committee that does it. So no. I, I just think it's completely unreasonable. So. But you, but why would the members of this committee not want to arm themselves with the information contained within the research paper on this issue? I think the, I think the, I, I hear what people have said and listen to it with respect, and I do would like to put on record that I respect people have different you know, ethical views on this, and they and they take a different view. Um, but the fact remains that this would be the first bit of, as I understand it, I don't think we did commission a formal bit of research from Ray's last week. I don't think we sent them away with, unless I'm Clark or others can correct me if that's wrong. I don't think we sent them away with a specific brief. We did. We did. We did. We did. No, we did. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Fair no, this is this was this was this is piece number four, mm -hmm. and it came from a specific question that was based on the issues around the wider remit of the department? Uh, well, in that, still, and not, still notwithstanding that, I still think it is this proceeding as a bit of research from the committee that was requested from the committee rather than individual members. If there was a situation in which individual members weren't able to request and then publicise this research, that would be different. But we do know that this will be, and I have found out this will be published on the committee homepage and raise as well as something the committee commissioned. Personally, I'm not comfortable with that given the um, controversy around the issue and the fact that individual members can commission it themselves. We're, in a sense, this isn't preventing individual, this isn't preventing people getting this information, it's just preventing it going to the auspices of this committee. Yes, sir. Uh, <coughs> sorry, Chair, I'd like to just. Uh, um, uh, support that position as well too, and uh, appreciate sort of the latitude that you'd hope to bring to the committee and the likes of it. But I do think that once again, it's one of these issues that can be dealt with by the individual themselves. And I don't think it's the business of this committee. So, if this member asks that this committee investigate this matter, can I expect the same response? I am really concerned. I am, I am, Chair, I am really concerned about a precedent set here mm. at the start of this term on research, on knowledge. I, I'm, I'm opposed to rates increases. Are you telling me that I, that you, if you ask for a paper on rates increases, possibilities on rates increases, that I'm going to object to a, a research paper? It's, this is not about same-sex marriage. This is about registrars with a conscience. It's a completely different aspect and thing, and I really worry that we're going to go down a line. And, and imagine somebody wanted to make a point of principle in this committee, and every time a person asked for a research paper, uh, they, they opposed it out of principle. We, we should be acting as a team, and, and if there's an inkling of something going wrong in this department, we need to shed a light on it. How do we do that? One of the ways is getting a research paper from Raise. That's it. Nobody's been asked to declare an interest or break a principle in that regard in a political matter. Sorry, just that. Yeah, the, the, sorry, sorry. I'm okay. I'm, I have already said my stated position on it, and for me, I can't. I mean, 
I can't see the difference. I hear what, what you've said, I hear what Paul said, I hear what Jim said, and I hear what my colleagues across the said. But I, I, I still hold to on something uh, for a piece of research which we were told we can do as individuals. I mean, if, if this was not available uh, to my colleague on his own, I would be supporting him fully on this in order to get this looked at and the research carried out on it. But I believe it is there for you on your own to get that research. No one's stopping you going out, and it will be the exact same research as we do. Uh, we do it as a committee. The, the other point I would, I would just make, and again with respect to Paul, is that the, I think he's right in, in working together as a team. I think there's been a huge amount of consensus on what are the challenges that need to be got to and, and, and discussed and done in a really robust way. And I thought the questioning today of the secretary, or the, the the minister and the permanent secretary were, were good, and there was, there was a you know a degree of consistency and, and consistency of approach among members. That's a, the kind of core business of the committee. In our forward work program, um, we haven't really focused on this as a core bit of business. And given the amount of Stuff we have in front of us, I think it would be it's 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 not a core bit of business, and I don't think there's any consensus that that, that it is that that's different from financial performance, fiscal sustainability, rates, all that stuff, in my view. But again, again, with respect, Paul, and I understand the the sincerity of the views that are held. Chair, how do we know? How do we know that this isn't a massive issue? Well, we um, don't want to know. That's, that's what we're saying. As a committee, that is what we're saying. If we refuse a member's request on research, really? But, but, but just to, to answer the point that Jim made, you know, there's, um, I, I don't think anyone is saying that you can't raise the disc, we couldn't, that this couldn't be raised. If the research was commissioned and it was uh, put on an agenda again and a, a member wanted to flag research information that they had brought, and, and have it discussed in the committee, that would be a reasonable thing to do. Now, people who disagreed with it from <coughs> their points, I'm sure, robustly as we have today, but um, there, that is a different thing from the committee as a whole, commissioning research, and I'm afraid I wouldn't feel comfortable. Uh, I, I can't speak for others, but I wouldn't feel comfortable well, myself. Okay, team, I, I didn't want to do this, but let's take it to the vote. Um, can I have a formal proposal that I we... Propose. I second. Okay. Sorry, so, Sorry, can, can I capture the formal proposal in, in writing, yeah. please? Yes, that we uh, commission research in respect of issues resulting from the requirement on civil registrars to conduct same-sex marriages, having regard to their employment rights, their conscience, and their religious beliefs, what arrangements exist for the protection of those, and how are those matters addressed in other jurisdictions? And jurisdictions would extend beyond United Kingdom. Mm. And can I add in seconding that proposal that not only do I second that proposal and support it, I, I want to protest gravely at the fact that the chairman, chairperson of this committee has been put in the position where he's had to take a vote in this. I think it's absolutely ridiculous and unfair on the chairperson. Mm. Well, that would uh, more than half that. So, all those in favour of the proposal uh, say Could we, could the uh, chair, could that be read out to us again? And can we make a counter proposal to that? So as we're not voting, I mean, is there, a, you know, where we can state that, uh, you know, that there is a mechanism in place for an individual to go and get that research, as, as already stated, and uh, on all of those grounds, uh, to try and get a wording around that. I mean, I, I, I'm not just saying that we should just take this as a one vote. I'm saying that uh, for most other people here, we believe that there is a mechanism there for any member to take that to research. So you're looking for a face saver? Mm. Not really. I just think that we, 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 we need to to counter that proposal. Just vote on it, Mr. Chairman. Mm. 
Sorry, Chair, can, can I just, uh, I've, I've missed a bit here trying to write it down, that the Committee for Finance Commission research in respect of issues relating to registrars having to conduct same-sex marriage with regard to their employment rights, mm -hmm. their human rights, and their religious beliefs, and the impact they're on, Probably need and how these matters are dealt with in other jurisdictions. So, uh, the Committee for Finance Commission research in respect of issues relating to registrars having to conduct same-sex marriage with regard to employment rights, human rights and religious beliefs and the impact thereon and what arrangements exist for protection of these and how are these matters addressed in other jurisdictions. That's fine. Okay. And it's we're taking that to the vote. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Those against? Nay. 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 Okay. Okay. S sorry, Chair, so we can just, for, for the record, uh, those in favour were Jim Allister, Paul Frew, and okay. the chairperson. Uh, those opposing were Matthew O'Toole, Pat Catney, uh, Sean Lynch, Melissa McHugh, and Gemma Dolan. Okay. Okay. Uh, can we move on to the next item? Uh, correspondence. Uh, four members consider the following correspondence. Correspondence from two business people and an accompanying uh, report relating to non-domestic rates. I need to declare an interest here because uh, I know these people who uh, raised this issue. Uh, can we seek agreement from, apart from me, to uh, return to a report where the, consider, the, the committee considers non-domestic rates in detail? Yes. Great. Uh, secondly, at uh, pages 229 to 233, uh, and again I need to make a report on this, I know uh, Katie Hayward uh, quite well, so again I had to declare an interest in this. Correspondence and an accompanying briefing note from Queen's University Head of Public Engagement on the topic of UK withdrawal, statutory instruments and devolved confidence. Um, after the last three years, uh, the Assembly EU exit working group has been actively engaged in consideration of the legal and practical issues arise from EU exit. This cross-directorate team includes representatives from Parliamentary Services, RAIS and the Legal Services Office. Should the Committee have any queries on these issues, appropriate briefings can be provided. May I ask the Committee to note? Yep. So noted. Uh, page 234, a request for the clerk to participate in an interview on gender budgeting and budgeting pro budgetary processes. Our members are content for... Are you content? Yes. More importantly, <laughs> are you content to take part in the interview? As, as long as members are content. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Okay. Um, Correspondence to note, a congratulatory letter to the chairperson and deputy chairperson from the Belfast Chamber, Belfast Chamber Chief Executive, uh, uh, and Mr. Simon Hamilton of these uh, provinces, along with its publication, Belfast Manifesto, and a copy can be viewed in the committee office room 373. Yep. Yeah, and it would be useful to, useful to have a briefing from Simon, a written briefing from Simon. Uh, would it be useful to have a written briefing from the uh, Chief Executive of Belfast Chamber of Commerce? On the subject matter of Belfast and improvements in Belfast, particularly what Not he's looking to. Not the rates issue, no. Hmm? Not the rates issue, no. It's part and parcel of it, but it's about it's, it's about urban regeneration, and particularly right, in Belfast. Yeah. I think it would be useful to have a written brief. Will this in favour say aye? Aye. aye. Okay. Uh, right, just cover the draft forward work programme. I just want to draw your attention to the updated draft forward work programme, page 239. Uh, ask if you're content to amend the forward work programme to bring forward the subordinate legislation currently scheduled from the 12th of February to the 5th of February. We talked about this earlier, but now we're in public session if we're so agreed. Uh, this will provide an opportunity for the committee to consider the statutory rules, and if any issues arise, officials can be asked to attend the following week. Uh, inform the members the committee office has received an SL1 proposal for statutory rule from the department entitled the Rate, Regional Rates Order Northern Ireland 2020. Are members content to add to the SL1 to next week's agenda when the land and property service officials will be in attendance? Yeah. Great. Yeah. Are members content with the updated forward work programme subject to the agreed amendment? Chair, could I suggest that we add to it a briefing from the supply officers in the department? 
Yes. Are we content with that? I think that would be appropriate. Yeah. <coughs> Members, do we have any other business? Uh, members, uh, next informal uh, briefing from Ray's again, 13.30 next uh, Wednesday, then a formal meeting at uh, 14.00 next Wednesday. Are we content? Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.